Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third of our Old Blue Talks this evening. Uh, throughout the tour, please put any questions you would like into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. We will be stopping for questions throughout and do some at the end. Um, technology on my part keeps going in and out, so I hope we're going to be all right for this evening. Um, and without further ado, uh, our speaker for today, Tony Brotherton. Hello. Hi Gina, um, and hello to everybody else. I've got absolutely no idea who's online, um, so I do hope that everybody is well, um, and thanks to Gina for organising this, and also thanks to Luke, um, who is our, our very able, we hope, uh, cameraman um, for, the, uh, for the next hour or so. Um, welcome to Yorkshire Dales Distillery. I did just want to spend a few minutes outside. I know there's, there's a little bit of road noise still going on. I hope you can hear me, um, and then we're going to move, move inside. Um, fairly shortly. I just wanted to uh, sort of create a little bit of a picture as to what we what we look like in terms of in terms of the business. This is our small industrial unit just outside Catrick Garrison, which uh, for the uninitiated is about a mile off the A1, about halfway between between York uh, and, and Newcastle. And we've been here for about five years. Uh, there's a little bit more road noise there, so without any further ado, I'm going to attempt to walk backwards um, into the into the distillery without falling over. Um, and then we'll pick things up, pick things up from there. Hopefully that's, uh, that's reduced the noise um, a little bit and we're, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, as we go on throughout, throughout the next hour or so, we're going to have to take a few pauses. Please put your questions into the sidebar. Uh, Gina is going to be um, emceeing the sidebar, asking any questions as we go through. So please ask anything, anything that's on your mind. I might be covering it later on any, anyway. But don't worry about that. Let's get the questions coming um, and let's try and have a bit of a conversation. Again, it's a little bit odd um, because I can't see the questions coming in and I can't, can't really bounce any conversation back off you. Um, but hopefully it will, it will all be well. As I said, uh, we've been here um, about five years. But to take things back, back a little bit further, um, I was at CH uh, in 1987 in PLB with Paul Madron as the housemaster. Um, and then PLA um, with Jim Mendicott as the housemaster um, before I went to university in Birmingham for three years and studied geography and planning. Uh, once I got my degree, um, I went to Sandhurst, um, spent a year in officer training at Sandhurst, followed by six months Royal Artillery Young Officers Training at Lark Hill, just outside Salisbury, um, and then joined my first unit, which was an armoured artillery unit um, out in Osnabrück in Germany, where I, I remained for three years. Then I came back to, to England and, and really my first tour in Yorkshire, which was at the Army Foundation College in Harrogate as a platoon commander instructor. And then I, I went from there uh, to being a forward observation officer, also in Yorkshire at another unit for, for three years. Moved there to be adjutant at another artillery unit in Yorkshire um, before staff college and, and a tour in Cyprus. I came back from Cyprus, um, took over a, an artillery battery, again at a different unit in Yorkshire, a little bit, little bit of a theme developing and remained there for the follow, following five years uh, before I fin finished my army career over the other side of the Pennines in, in Lancashire. Now about halfway through um, my army career, I had the exceptional good fortune that she is lives listening and watching tonight um, to meet Sarah. Sarah bought a bread in Teesside, um, and we met in York. Um, I was on a stag do, she was on a hen do, and alcohol is going to be a little bit of a little bit of a theme um, this evening. Um, and we were married uh, about two years later when I came back um, from my uh, from an Iraq tour, and we decided that when when we left when we left the army that we wanted to do something very local something with genuine provenance, something that would put something back into the community. Um, and having worked up a number of different, different business ideas, um, we settled on the idea of setting up a, uh, a distillery. Not necessarily a, a gin distillery or a whiskey distillery or a rum distillery, um, but really a, a business that would turn its hand to making good quality spirits using as many ingredients and raw materials in terms of bottles um, that are available as locally as possible, 
but most importantly, um, the sorts of people that we wanted to employ. Um, so we have always, since the beginning, prioritised the employment um, of young people, long-term unemployed, ex-offenders and veterans. And recently, we've been able to lean into to the Kickstart scheme um, to expand our staff. And we've got another three young people due to be joining us for at least six months, um, starting in the middle of April. So that, that, is, that is absolutely great, great news. So the business has been running um, for, for about five years. We started off um, making gin. Um, we made, again, I'll, I'll talk you through all of our spirits um, a, a little bit later on. Um, and we, we launched the gin, um, as I say, about, about five years ago. We then built on that, producing a number of other London dry gins, a vodka um, and an aged rum. And then we, we branched out into making some fruit-based gins, a little bit of colour, a little bit of different flavour, and adding, adding to our own range. One thing that perhaps we weren't expecting when we, when we first started the business was the number of people that would get in touch with us and ask us to make products, products for them. Now we've grown year on year, um, for the last last five years, nothing massive, but good good steady growth. And currently, about eighty percent of our work is contract work, producing um, various spirits for other brands, and about twenty percent of our work is the the production and sales um, of our own ranges of spirits. Um, this is really um, our dispatch bay. We've got a unit here; it's about about two two thousand square foot. And the first thing that you come across coming into, coming into this dispatch bay is two very large IBCs, both full of, full of spirit, which is one of our, one of our key, key raw materials. Um, this one on, on my right is white rum at 95, 95%. That is sourced from a distillery in Guyana, formerly uh, the colony of, of Demerara, um, and it's produced to a very high standard there. Further over, we have a 96% grain spirit um, produced in the UK. The, the rum is, is clearly a base ingredient for, for many of the rums that we produce. And the grain spirit is the key base ingredient for our London dry gins, our flavoured gins, um, and our, our vodka. 99% of the gin which is produced in the UK is made from a UK produced or European produced grain spirit refined to 96%, redistilled in a process called rectification, and then blended down um, to, a, to, to, a bottle, to a bottle in strength. It's particularly challenging for small distilleries to A, produce a grain spirit of the quality um, which is required for, for high grade gin or, or, or vodka but equally to produce it in a, in a cost-effective manner. That said, we are a distillery, we do distill. Um, and by definition, distillation is the production of, of an alcoholic spirit, but from scratch. So we've done a number of different fermentation product uh, projects, um, including making a, a potato vodka for McCain, for the potatoes that they use for their chips. We've been involved in a, um, in a circular economy project, taking the waste from um, supermarket potatoes, which can't be like supermarket potatoes that would go to the supermarket, but they're too small or don't quite fit in with specifications, taking those, fermenting them, distilling them, and making a, a actually a really, really quite a, quite a nice gin. Equally, we've been involved in projects taking um, waste, supermarket waste, strawberries and raspberries, fermenting those, distilling, distilling the product and making, um, making some great products with those. So although we are a distillery, we do distill, we do create alcohol from scratch in a number of niche areas. Our principal business involves bringing in high-grade alcohol that other people have produced and do, doing other things with it. And that's the way most of the distilleries in the, in the UK function. While we're down at this end of the distillery, I'll just take you over here, um, which rather irritatingly I stacked a load of boxes in front of earlier. Um, this stainless steel vessel at the back contains Swale Valley water. Now we knew when we first set up a distillery 
that our water would, would be absolutely critical. We use two different types of water here, one of which I'm going to come on to um, a little bit later on. When we first started using Swale Valley water, we go and visit a campsite just outside Richmond, which has its own borehole, picking up our, our water jerry cans, putting them in the boot of the car um, and bringing them here. Now we have it delivered about a ton at a time, puts onto circulation into a storage tank and is kept there um, until we need it. And my throat's going a little bit dry already, so I'm just going to defer to Gina at this stage to see if we've got any questions that have come in already. And if you haven't put any questions in already, please do. Let's start the conversation going um, and let's see what we've got. So Gina, I don't know if you've got any comments at this stage. Um, nothing in at the moment. Lovely. Um, I hope we've got an audience. Can you see we've got an audience? I'm not just talking. We to have you. got an audience, yeah. We have got an audience for sure. Um, just no right. questions at the moment. Okay, no, no problem at all. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to head down to, to, the, um, to the back of the distillery over to, to where the stills are to talk a little bit about the distillation process um, and the way in which we, we make our spirits. So we have, um, we have two stills uh, here at the distillery. A number of you um, may be involved in brewing and distilling, may have been to visit um, distilleries um, and seen the names that, that people give to stills. We've kept things relatively simple. This is our, this is our small still. Uh, and over to my right, this is, this is the large still, uh, which makes it really simple for all the staff to understand um, exactly what's going on. The principles um, of, the, of the work that we do are identical, whether we're working with the small or, or the large still. I'm just going to explain that using using a small still, and and then and then take it over from there. So at the um, at the bottom of the, the small still, we have a 30 litre boiler, and that sits on top of a in this case a trusty T fold induction hob. At the start of the distillation process, we put a liquid into the boiler. Now typically. That would be a mixture of the white rum that we've already seen or the high grade grain spirit with either the Swale Valley water or a different water and we heat it up. If we were distilling from scratch, we would have something like a beer made from malt or a wine if we were to make something like a brandy or, or if we had made a wine from strawberries, raspberries, soft fruit into the boiler and started to heat it up. The beauty of the equipment that we have here is that it's all modular. We can take it all apart and reconfigure it and do different things um, in, order, in order to get different results. Once the uh, spirit and the water, <coughs> excuse me, in the boiler has started warming up, we'll start to see a vapor um, coming, coming off, off the liquid. Now, again, when, when, when I'm talking to people at the distillery um, and in various other places, it's always good to, uh, to ask who's got what experience in terms of a scientific background, whether we've got any microbiologists or biochemists or anyone that's in the brewing and distilling industry, just so that I'm not, not teaching people to suck eggs. But unfortunately, I've got no idea um, about the audience that, that's here this evening. So perhaps if it is overly simple for, for a couple of people, then, then I do, I do, I do apologise. Um, we'll start to, to, to note a, a vapor rising from the surface of the liquid, which is in the boiler, <coughs> into, into the column. Um, this is what's known, known as a reflux column. And, and this one, um, as I think you could probably see, Luke will be able to tell me whether we can see that or not, has, has three copper plates in it. Um, relatively small, this is a, this is a two inch column. Um, so a copper plate there, a copper plate there, and a, and a copper plate. Just, just higher up. As the, uh, the liquid warms, it gets towards the, the point at which the ethanol will vaporize and start coming off. It will rise, rise up the column. As it rises up the column, it will consecutively condense back down into a liquid and reboil on the copper plates until it exits the top of the column. There's a number of different things um, or processes that are at work here. 
but we, we end up refining the spirit that's already pre pretty well refined to a higher level, strengthening the, um, the alcohol content as we go up. All of our, all of our spirits bar, bar a couple, and we make probably somewhere between 50 and 60 different products on a regular basis now, um, are made using botanicals in what we would call an aroma basket, which sits at the top of the still. <coughs> we put our botanicals into what's like a, um, like a coffee percolator, inserted into the, into the aroma head, and the hot vapor passing through the aroma head strips the volatile flavors from the botanicals. And here we're talking about principally for something like a London dry gin, juniper, citrus peels, angelica root, orris root, maybe something like some pimp peppercorns, which will give it a bit of sweetness, coriander, cardamom. Those are sort of typical, typical spices or botanicals. Once the vapors pass through the overhead, we'll then condense it back down into a liquid and collect through this device here, which is called a parrot. <coughs> I'm not gonna give out any prizes um, for guessing why it's called a parrot. The liquid builds up. We can put a hydrometer into the top to measure the strength of the alcohol that's coming off and then collect through, through the spout. Typically over the course of a distillation, a large distillation on the small, this small still will take maybe somewhere between five and six hours and we'll end up collecting a spirit at about 75%. If we refer over to the large still now, which is still nice and warm um, from a day's distilling, we have exactly the same principles at play. Instead of having a small boiler on an induction hob, we have a, a larger boiler. We've gone from 30 liters to 300 liters. And the, um, instead of heating with the induction hob, we have a number of large immersion heaters which are fitted into the boiler, uh, which looks giving us a nice close up of at the moment. Heading up the column and trying to step out of the way of the reflection, you can see the three much larger copper plate stages, which in this case have nice, nice brass, uh, brass frontages to them. And then at the top of the assembly, you'll see in this case, two aroma baskets, which are kept in parallel a condenser on the far side for condensing the liquid down, and then a collection hose, which hopefully Luke will be able to follow into a collection vessel. Now, typically on the largest still, we'll be looking at production runs of anywhere between eight and nine, and for much larger ones, anything up to 14 hours in terms of production of a large batch on the larger still. Once we've collected our spirit from the still at about, as I say, at about 75%, we'll check it. And if it's something like a London dry gin, the only thing that we'll add to that is water to reduce it to a bottling strength. And in this case, anywhere between 37.5% and 50% are our, our bottling strengths. We do occasionally do, do a cask finished or a cask length product. Um, <coughs> but normally, somewhere between 37.5% and 50%, depending on, on, on the type of product. Now, you're not going to be able to see it particularly easily, I'm afraid. Just tucked away in the corner here, we have a uh, deionizing filter. So this is the second source of water that we have at the distillery. And so we take the mains water in, we remove all of the chlorine that's in it, any of the other chemicals that are added, and any of the, the mineral solids which are dissolved in the water. This is very, very important for some of our products because the, uh, the dissolved solids in the water, once they're mixed with the alcohol, we can end up with a sort of clouding and a precipitate in the bottle, which is not attractive to the customer. That's particularly, it's a particular challenge when we're working with aged and colored products. The other thing we're gonna have a look at over here is, is the deck that we have. And at the moment we have one vessel sitting on the deck um, where we have some rum aging. So having made our spirit, brought the raw materials in, distilled, 
reduced her bottling strength. The next job is to bottle it. I'm just going to give you a, a, a little idea of what the bottling line looks at, at looks like at this scale. If you excuse me, just turning away for a second. And we'll allow Luke to, um, to navigate his way through the curtains. And it's slightly echoey in here, so I'll, I'll, I'll apologize for that. Um, we've, we've recently been approved at the um, Safe and Local Suppliers Standard, which is one of two um, food and drink manufacturing standards which operate in the UK. They're internationally recognized um, so the Salsa standard um, is for is really aimed at, aimed at smaller businesses, and the British Retail Consortium standard is, is much more achievable from, from larger businesses. So particularly pleased with that. <coughs> but in order to achieve that, one of the things we have to do is put in a new a new bottling area. Um, the procedure here is is bringing in pallets of bottles. In this case, this pallet pallet is nearly empty. They're rinsed by hand in a rinsing sink. They're then filled on the bottling line, capped, and then passed through into the other area in the distillery for labeling and packaging for dispatch. Um, I'm not going to ask anyone if they've got any, any questions in here because it's actually pretty echoey. Um, so what we're going to do now is, I think we're just going to pause the audio and the video while we go upstairs in the distillery where we're going to talk a little bit more about the spirits that we make. Um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm sure that, that Gina can catch up with, with any questions, if we have got any questions um, that have come in, but we're going to have a little bit of a peek at some rum that we've got aging upstairs so that we can show you, show you what that looks like. So I'll just ask Luke now to, to pause the video and the audio. I'm going to pop my face back up for a minute while Tony runs up the stairs. Um, Tony, you probably can still hear me. We now have um, masses of questions for you. Uh, hopefully when you get to the top, you can grab yourself a, a bottle of water or a bottle of rum and, um, and have a swig. Um, but when the camera comes back on, lots of questions, um, quite a lot pertaining to the, the stuff you've just told us. So maybe we'll stop for those before you start your next explanation. Okay, uh, I think we're, we're now back live. Um, just before we take any questions and before I move over to the table where we've, we've got some other bits and pieces set up, um, I just wanted to show you this on, on the way past. Hopefully Luke will be able to capture that. Um, so that's quite a large batch of rum. It's at 65%, which is a, a good aging strength with some English oak staves, um, which we have toasted um, and some pineapple from uh, Costa Rica uh, that was sitting there this is actually uh, it's not ours it's uh, it's an award-winning run um, that we make for for another brand um, and that was sitting there probably four five six weeks until it's ready to be filtered um, and reduced to a bottling strength and bottled and now we're going to try and try an interesting maneuver where Luke will go down one side of the table and I'll go around the other side of the table um, and hopefully we'll get into a position where we can answer some questions. Brilliant. So, Gina, can you see me there? Yeah, you're back. Oh, oh, far too much of me on that screen. Um, <laughs> you. Uh, while we're figuring that out. Um, yeah, we, we've got lots of questions. So we're just trying to filter out the ones that have uh, got something to do with what you've just spoken about. And then we'll, we'll come to okay. some more after that. So... Um, right. Cindy's asked, what local botanicals do you forage for in your region? Right. Um, now, the, the one that immediately springs to mind is a honey. Um, and again, we can talk about that past when we go, go through some of the spirits. So we, have, we use a honey, which is, comes from about a mile and a half away from, from the distillery. In a number of the products, we use heather. Um, we use gorse, um, which come from the moors. We have a number of local soft fruit suppliers. <clears throat> which we use in, um, in several, in fact, a, a large number of our products um, include soft fruit, 
Um, rhubarb from the um, from the rhubarb triangle in Yorkshire. One of our products, which again, um, Sarah will probably have to tell me whether it's award winning or not, um, uses a sea kelp, uh, which comes from um, a company near Scarborough who take a, a daily harvest um, of sea kelp, um, which I think is supplied across the UK and probably even Europe in terms of a, um, a food ingredient. I'm just trying to think about some of perhaps some of the other botanicals looking across to um, the store as to we grow our own um, bison grass at home actually some people might have had um, a bison grass vodka from from Poland um, we were asked a number of years ago to to make a gin um, which incorporated the bison grass um, supplies of it were a little bit tricky, so we decided that we would uh, we would grow some of that at home. Um, it, it is a little bit challenging to grow, but we uh, we cut and dry that. Um, again, the um, grapefruit peel supply can be a little bit tricky as well, so we tend to peel and dry um, our own grapefruits. There's a there's a number of herbs which are grown locally, um, with, which we use. We have a great supply down in Thirsk um, in terms of the herbs. And a number of our customers grow their own their own fruit and herbs, which they then ask to be included um, in products. Okay, um, and a little pop up on my screen has just come up from Sarah saying, "Yes, it is award winning." <laughs> well, that's um, yeah. I uh, so Max has asked, "What's the monthly production of the distillery?" Right at the moment, well, yeah, it's it's difficult to tell because the um, the lockdown has obviously had an, an enormous um, impact on us. Um, I'm still a, a serving army officer in the army reserve, um, so about a year ago um, I volunteered to be mobilised. We effectively closed the distillery, um, although I was I was working weekends and evenings to to dispatch product that we'd already made. Um, and I was mobilized for four months coordinating uh, COVID staff support from the military uh, into, into the Northeast. We then had a really, really busy August. Um, September, we spent sort of reconfiguring the distillery. Things built up again in October. November and December were probably the busiest months that we've ever had. And so we'll, so we'll probably attest to that in terms of, in terms of the figures. We had a, a, a normal, quiet January where um, retailers are restocking, but obviously we didn't see any restocking from many of the bars. Um, but February and March have been extremely quiet. Um, we were predicting an uplift in April, uh, and we've seen that in terms of the orders that we've received so far. So that, that is a, a little bit of a relief. Um, I suspect that we, we average somewhere between two and 4,000 bottles a month um, over the last, the last financial year, um, but we're looking at being somewhere in the region of 10,000 bottles a month by November. Okay, and I'm going to stick with Max, who's asked another question, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the purpose of the 30 litre still if you have a larger one? Is it for testing or one-offs? Um, yes, we use the 30 litre still um, for trials and development. When we first opened, that was the only still, still that we had, um, and we were making smaller batches and multiple small batches. So if we have an order from a customer for anything up to a couple of hundred bottles, then we'll make that using the smaller still. And if we have to run it through three or four times to get the volume that's required, then that's what we'll do. But another example, um, this week we supply an own brand gin to a shop in Harrogate, and they will typically order 30 to 36 bottles at a time. So that's just a small batch on the small still. Um, it doesn't take, take us obviously very, very long to do. We'll bottle that um, and that's getting supplied. So we had an order last week. We made it on Monday and unusually because they want it, um, they want it for Easter. We're dropping that off um, for them tonight. Normally we would like to wait at least a week um, between distilling reduction to bottling strength and then the bottling to ensure that all the flavors have plenty of plenty of time time to develop before before we bottle but yeah that 30 liter still is in regular use and often we're using both stills at the same time to make different things okay uh, and i've got one from graham which is yorkshire is well known for soft water does the hardness affect either the taste or the process uh, 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 and the water's hard 
Absolutely, it does. Um, we use the Swell Valley water in our own products. I think Luke might be able to pan along to the, um, the Ram range on this side. Now, you won't actually be able to see it, but if I was to put one of these products um, onto a supermarket shelf next to something like a Smirnoff vodka, you would be able to see that they're not as clear. The other thing, and I don't think we have got any of it here, is you can end up with some more obvious hazing developing on the bottom of the bottle. We don't get any solids, but the liquid isn't as clear and we can get a bit of hazing on the, on the bottom of the bottle. However, the spirits are really, really smooth. Um, and we think that's worth, the, worth the, the sacrifice in terms of the clarity. Um, there's only one or two of our contract customers, however, who will use that water. Most of them will use a deionized water, which delivers a clarity, which is closer perhaps to what a customer expects to see on the shelf. Okay, um, and uh, this one's anonymous. I don't know who this is from, but how many pilot trials do you usually do before doing a larger run? That, that, that's a really good question. Um, we, we have a little bit of a, a standing joke and probably wouldn't find it very funny, um, but there's a number of uh, brands in the UK and, and worldwide who will make a particular thing about the number of trials that they went through before they finally landed on the the spirit that, that they want. What we'll always say to customers who come to us and indeed when we're developing our own products, the more you think about what you're trying to achieve before you commit to trying to make anything, the less time we actually spend on the equipment, which is the expensive and the time consuming, time, time consuming part. Um, some of the products that you can see in front of you here um, in our ranges, we would have had one or two trials on maybe up to up to up to six or seven in some cases um the only time we've really run into difficulty with a contract customer is when we've made a product for them which they loved but then they've realized that it wasn't actually what they wanted it was what they asked for but not what they wanted so we've had to start the whole um whole development process over again but normally two or three trials on a small still is sufficient to then be able to transfer um, up into production batches. But actually, that transfer itself from something which is being done experimentally up to production is often the, often the biggest challenge <clears throat> in terms of reproducing the flavors and the characteristics of a product um, at a larger scale. Okay, uh, I'll give you one more and then um, get you on your way again. We've still got a lot in the background, so we'll get to them afterwards. But, um... <laughs> Why do you use staves in the rum instead of aging in wooden barrels? Um, we have got a license to age in oak barrels. Um, it's really a matter of cost and time. Um, again, we have a number of customers lined up who are going to be buying their own, their own casks. Um, we have a great cooper just down the road in Ripon, um, and that's where we go to get the staves from. Um, however, if you age with oak staves, you can get a, a very, very similar effect. And you'll find if you delve into it, the, the world of distilling and spirit products has an awful lot of smoke and mirrors in it. Um, you, can, you can achieve a very, very similar effect, getting the flavors, particularly the vanilla from the oak, getting the dark colors from, from the toasting over a relatively, relatively short period of time. And there are continuing debates, particularly in the, in the whiskey fraternity, of the benefit or even the requirement to age whiskey for, for three years. Okay. Um, there's, some, there's something that's come in, which I think um, is to do with that. So Harriet said, who gives the license and why is it needed for aging the oak? Um, it's, a, it's a license which is issued by HNRC for um, all of the aspects of production at the distillery. Um, we, we actually, I think, have about eight or nine different licenses um, in order to operate. If we start from a from a personal level, um, I hold a distiller's license, which allows us to ferment wines and beers and then extract the alcohol to make a spirit. Um, I hold a compounder's license, which enables me to distill that spirit in the presence of, for example, gin botanicals, to then add flavor to the spirit. And I hold a rectifier's license, which enables me to redistill the high strength spirit 
and make something different with it. So that's three, three different personal licenses. Um, naturally, we hold a premises license with the local authority for the sale of, of alcoholic beverages on and off the premises. We also um, have a license through the Alcohol Wholesalers Registration Scheme, which is an HMRC scheme to reduce fraud in alcohol supply. This premises is also licensed by HMRC as a distillery, i.e. somewhere where we can ferment malt or fruit to make the beers and the wines and then distill. But it also has a separate excise entry as a what's called, what's called an excise warehouse trade facility, which allows us to hold alcohol here in duty suspension. And this is part of that last one, um, acting as, as a trade facility that specifies that we're allowed to age spirit and how long we're allowed to age it for. In this case, we're allowed to age rum for up to 48 months and we're allowed to age whiskey for up to, um, sorry, correction, we're allowed, to age, we're allowed to age the rum for up to 24 months and the whiskey for up to and over 36 months. But that's specified on the license. And if we wanted to change that, we'd have to go back to HMRC and, and apply for that to be amended. Okay. I'm going to let you crack on and then we'll get to some more questions after. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to a drink. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'll have to be careful, careful drive, driving home this evening. Um, so for the, for the next stage here, and I've just, just got a half, a half an eye on the time, um, just to talk you through the range of spirits that we have um, in our own brands, really to, to highlight some of the differences um, in, in production techniques um, and, and some of the characteristics. Now, the first... The first gin that we made was Purple Ram London Dry Gin. It's a London Dry Gin. What, make, what makes it a London Dry Gin? We start off with a 96% grain spirit. We rectify that in the still in the presence of botanicals. And the only thing that we're allowed to add to it after we've, we've rectified, distilled it, um, is water. If you add anything other than water to it, it can't be a London, a London gin. So if you add any sugars, calories, flavors, then it can't be a London dry gin. So potentially in, in the supermarket, um, wherever you go to, to buy your spirits, if you see something that's labeled as a, a dry gin, it's, it's not made using, using the London method. And there's obviously quite a lot of genuine and um, other sort of snobbishness about the way in which, in way in which those, those gins are made. Um, purple Ram bottled at 40%, made with a local honey, um, a number of other ingredients which, which I might not discuss here. It's quite fragrant, quite smooth, and we'll, um, we'll show you how to serve a nice gin tonic with it um, in, a, in a few minutes. <coughs> the, uh, the second gin um, in our range here is also a London dry gin. This is Wild Ram. Wild Ram is made slightly differently. We use red currants, black currants, and gooseberries from Yorkshire, which go into the boiler. It doesn't give it a strong berry flavor. If you, if you look to my left-hand side here, these are strong fruit-flavored gins, um, and we've got a rum, rum there as well. Putting fruit into the boiler or using fruit during the distillation or compounding process generally doesn't give a spirit a very, very strong fruit, fruit flavor. And without steeping the spirit in fruit or adding some fruit flavors after distillation, it, it's not possible to, to achieve that. <coughs> um, wild Ram is also much drier. Um, it has more juniper in it, which, which gives, makes it drier. Um, and it also has heather in it, which again, gives, gives quite, a, quite a dry mouth in. That's probably our most popular gin. Um, way, the way I explain it to people is if you can imagine um, what they would be drinking in Endeavour or, or Morse, it's a classic British dry gin, but you can't really get a hold of gins like that anymore because even the, even the classic British dry gins have moved on in terms of flavor. Um, Desert Ram um, harks back to, to my, my army career. It's bottled at 50%. Again, very popular, um, a good local following um, of the Desert Ram. And that's sort of uh, North African and Middle Eastern in style. It's heavy on the bitter orange, the rose, the cardamom. And I wanted to make that like walking into the market in Basra um, without the open sewer. 
Um, it's, it's probably my favourite, um, and I say it's got a really, really good local following. Uh, the next, next product here is our Smoky Ram Vodka. This was actually the, the second spirit that, that we ever made, and we wanted to make a, a really nice sort of sipping vodka. We, um, in the politest possible way, we smoke um, black peppercorns at the distillery. We put them into the overhead, and then we distill the alcohol through it to make, to make this vodka. So it's not a pure vodka, um, because we are actually adding, adding a botanical into it. The, um, the smoky and um, smoky flavors and the, um, and the pepperiness really come through, um, but, it's, but it's very smooth. The next product, or the final product, product in this range is the Intrepid Ram Yorkshire Rum, bottled at 45%. So this starts life um, in the Caribbean, in Guyana, and comes to us um, at, at 95%. We then redistill that with, again, Heather, um, and, the, and the local honey, which I mentioned earlier. And then we okage that for as long as I can. Um, and normally, we're not gonna suggest how, how long, you know, it, it's been as, as, long, um, as long as I can to get, get those flavors, flavors really developed. Um, we actually use a um, French oak in this, um, in this product, because it's much higher in vanillins than, uh, than the English oak that we use, that you saw that you saw earlier. Blended down to, to bottling strength, um, but unusually for a rum, no sugar added at all. Um, so it's got quite an unusual flavor for a rum and some people see it as being, being more akin um, to a whiskey. Now I think what I'm gonna do now um, is make myself a gin and tonic and show you how to make it, which will save my, my throat um, a little bit before we move on to, to looking at, at some of the fruit gins. Um, none of the serves that I'm going to show you today are going to be particularly complicated, um, but I will start, start with a purple ram um, gin and tonic. In fact, I'm going to start with the desert ram. Um, so I'm going to start off by putting a reasonable amount of ice um, into the glass. Important to note, the more, the more ice you have, um, the slower it melts. So although we're putting more, more water into the glass, potentially we're ending up with a, a gin and tonic, which will taste good for longer. Although obviously if you leave it for a while in a warm place, um, it is going to uh, again, <laughs> get quite watery. Um, these are, are really handy, a, a peel, peel knife. You can pick them up in, in various places. Because the desert ram is so strong, it doesn't need an awful lot to be served with it. So all I'm gonna do is take a little bit of peel um, from this grapefruit, um, pop that, into the glass. Um, I've just realized that I've completely forgotten to put my spirit measures out. Um, so I'm gonna put a, a sensible amount um, of the desert ram in. I'm just gonna try and pour it over the top of the peel just to pick up some of the, um, some of the citrus flavors. Top that up with a, a good quality, in this case, um, fever tree, tonic water. A lot of people ask us um, what the, um, what the best uh, tonic water um, is. We, um, we generally tend to use Fever Tree or, or Fentimans, but there are some great independent producers um, of tonic water out there. Um, so, so personal preference is always key. Um, we wouldn't necessarily shy away from tonic water supplied from discount supermarkets either. And in fact, on some taste tests that we've done here at the distillery, um, a couple of those have, have come out on top. Um, one thing to be a little bit careful with, um, with, with tonic waters and, and other mixes um, is the types of sweeteners that are used. Fever Tree and Fentimans for us win because although this is a, a refreshingly light product, um, it doesn't contain any of the traditional sweeteners that are associated with diet or low sugar, sugar drinks. Um, it contains fructose, um, which gives it a nice sweetness um, but without potentially some of the other, the other drawbacks. Um, I'm just going to have a sip of this. Um, and Gina, have you got any more questions we can answer before I move on to the other spirits? Uh, yeah, I've got lots of questions, actually. Um, so uh, Harriet says, well, she's asked two questions, actually, so I'll give them to you both. Uh, what's your favourite gin in your own range? And how do you get the honey in the spirit? Okay, so as I said, I think the Desert Ram 
um, is probably my my favourite spirit in a, in our own range. Um, so just drying up a little bit again. I'm going to keep keep that keep that close to me. Um, the honey goes into the boiler. Um, so we treat that exactly the same as any of the other potato fat. Sorry, it goes into the overhead. Um, we treat that exactly the same as we do with any of the other um, botanicals. The hot, the hot alcohol vapor passes through it, draws out the volatile flavors, and then we condense it back down into a liquid at the end. Now, the only exception to that is one gin that we make, um, we have to be careful what I say, which is a honey and nettle gin. Now, nettle is particularly difficult to work with, and a small amount of honey does go into the, uh, the finished product at the end is, is warmed up and blended with the finished product. Um, and two of our rums, um, not, not the one, not in our own ranges, but, but for other customers, are made with some honey blended into the, into the finished liquid. But you do have to be a little bit careful with it. Um, honey is quite unpredictable. Um, and some of the, the sugars, some of the pollens, for example, you have a, a honey that's, got, that's high in a particular type of pollen, and you have to forgive me, I'm not an expert on, on different types of pollen. You can end up with, with a very cloudy product and it's very difficult to predict when that's going to happen. Okay, I, I'm going to ask the next question, but we've had quite a few along the same lines. Um, so the question from Richard is, uh, I'm sure CH Science Labs equipped you well for life in a distillery, but you spent the last 15 years in the armed forces. What skills from your army career have equipped you best for venturing out into a second career. And then there's lots of people asking the same thing as Anne-Marie, which kind of follows on, which was, how did you learn everything you needed to know in order to set up a distillery? Was it something you had a previous knowledge in? Um, you, I'll probably take, take the second question first. I feel a bit like, a bit like the Prime Minister in the, in, the, um, in the briefing room here, looking around me, who's going to answer the questions? Um, the, in, in terms of uh, no, we'll go back. In, term, in terms of in terms of my army career, um, when we when we decided that I was going to leave the army, um, and we knew we wanted to set up a business, we knew from previous experience that that we could run a business effectively. Um, Sarah's run a number of successful businesses in the past and has a, a, a strong business background. Um, my expertise from the army was in operations and training. Um, so in terms of setting up a production business, um, I actually found that side of things reasonably straightforward. Even the complexities of dealing with HMRC um, and compliance, I was quite familiar with sort of government terminology, um, reading policy, implementing policy, training our people. Um, and I, I suppose I don't, don't want to talk about leadership too much. So sort of looking after and, and developing people, um, I think, were key. Uh, I'm sure Sarah would agree. The one thing that neither of us came into the business with is uh, sales and marketing experience. Um, five years in, we're still, still really learning that. Um, in terms of the technical side of brewing and distilling, um, I always tell people that the only thing I got in trouble for at school was for brewing. Um, and I think we were we were made to do some gardening, which seemed to be quite a quite a light punishment. Um, although mine was at a much smaller scale than uh, than what what some people were were doing, um, personal consumption only. Um, but it's always been an interest of mine, and um, been extremely fortunate. My my dad has been in the um, not not specifically in the brewing and distilling industries, but in the food production industry. Um, for his entire career from a, from a process engineering side. Um, so I've always had that sort of, sort of there in the back of my mind, I suppose. Um, and having, having left the army, um, I've had access to significant funding for a university course, at, uh, an MSc at Harriet Watt University in Brewery and Distilling. Um, I've taken my time on that. Four years in, I've completed all of the taught phases of it. Um, and I'm just about to start a project into, this is a, a little, bit, little bit of geekery, um, the enzymatic conversion of starches and potatoes um, as, part of the, um, as part of the distilling process. 
Oh. Okay, I've got a few more, but I think maybe if you uh, if you do your next bit, and then I've got some for the very end. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Gina. Um, I'm just going to turn turn my head slightly slightly to this side now, um, and talk about our uh, our YD range. Um, a couple of years in, the um, the RAM range is doing well, but it's not really hitting the mark in terms of the sort of the breadth of the market in Yorkshire, in the North, in the UK, in, term, in terms of what, what the customer wants. Um, and I suspect that, that everybody in the audience has seen, seen products that look something like this um, in the supermarkets um, and, and, and elsewhere. The, the important thing that we wanted to, to develop with the YD range, um, firstly, the use of, of, of real fruit going into products, um, so these are all made with real fruit um, and they're also made all made with real fruit extracts. Um, and that's the tricky thing. Um, we work with a, a company who are based in Kent um, who specialize <coughs> in extracting natural flavors, um, which we then combine with the distilled spirit after distillation to produce much stronger fruit flavors, but without using anything. Um, in terms of artificial chemistry. Um, I suspect that, again, many of the audience have, have bought or tasted fruit gins and fruit spirits, um, which taste, taste very artificial um, because they're blended um, with effectively a chemi chemically constructed um, flavor. Um, so working from, from my right, um, we have a, a brambleberry gin, which is distilled with um, blackberries in the boiler and then blended down um, with um, a, a blackberry natural flavor after distillation. <coughs> You'll note from the experience on the right hand side in terms of the ram range that when spirits come off the still they are all clear. So if, if you're buying anything which is colored and it is a spirit then the color has been added, added afterwards. And again we use natural colors um, in this case, the, the reds come from the, um, the carmazine beetle. And again, some uh, abiologists will probably pick me up um, on, on the sources of, of carmine as a, as a color. Um, blue cornflower is also an excellent, um, excellent natural color. Um, and caramel um, is widely used uh, as in highly, highly processed sugar. Um, caramel even added to, to some, of the, some of the spirits that you might not think it's added to. Give, gives a depth of color, um, but allows us to use something which, which is natural. Um, very low in sugar. Typically, some of our competitors will be anywhere between 10 and 15% sugar. We're down at about one, um, maybe heading up, potentially with the rum up to about 3% about in sugar. Uh, strawberry and Thai basil gin, um, made with strawberries um, from a farm estate in, in East Yorkshire, um, and Thai basil from our herb supplier in Thursk, a honeyed rhubarb gin made with our local honey and rhubarb from the rhubarb triangle, um, a chocolate orange gin, not massively Yorkshire, um, orange peel, a, a really, really good um, cocoa chocolate extract, and again, low in sugar, um, and our, our spiced rum, which people describe um, as being just like Christmas. Um, I'm going to make a, another gin and tonic now, um, just to uh, to show you a little bit more. I've got four drinks to make. I'm obviously not going to be able to drink them all tonight, so I'll probably bo bottle them up um, and take them home. Um, so this this would be a a purple ram gin and tonic. Again, a nice amount of ice. Again, we go back to our, our trusty grapefruit. Grapefruit is a is a particular favourite of ours. Um, but I'm just going to take a, a slice of the grapefruit on this occasion, which will give us a little bit more juice um, into the glass. Uh, excuse me, looking down and watching while I, while I don't cut my fingers off. Now, we often see um, in bars and at events um, drinks that seem to be served with the entire vegetable garden in it. Um, we, we really don't think that's necessary. In this case, there's a, a fresh basil leaf. Um, from a basil which I picked up in Tesco's earlier and I'll be eating the rest of it for, for lunch tomorrow. Um, a small amount of purple ram, 
just poured again over the fruit, over the leaf to try and pick up as much flavor as possible. If you want a little bit more flavor, crimp, crimping the leaf will, will, will release a lot more in terms of the oils. And then topped up, as we said before, with a, a decent quality tonic water. People often ask about the proportions of tonic water to gin. My personal preference is about one third gin to, to two thirds tonic. Um, but again, plen plenty of people, uh, people prefer um, different mixes. Gina, do you want to crack on with another question or two? Yeah, sure. Um, what have we got? So um, Graham's asked, how can we know when buying fruit flavored gin, whether the fruit flavor is natural or man-made? Yeah. I think it's very unfortunate that you can't, um, unless you have a discerning palate um, or know anything about the, the production process. Um, because spirit drinks are exempt from many of the labeling requirements which affect other products, um, it's very, very difficult to identify if you're just looking at the label or even, even if you're trying it. Um, if you have a, a reliable supplier who you, who you trust, um, then I, I think that's, that's probably about as good as, good as it's gonna get. Okay, and, and again from Graham, as a fan of rums, having cut my teeth in the Caribbean, what is the difference between a UK produced fine golden rum and one produced in the Caribbean or Venezuela? So the, the base rum is likely to be very similar, um, but all sorts of things happen with rum. And again, there's a, there's a slight caution on the labeling. Um, you may, may well have seen Graham that rums are advertised with different ages, um, but it's not regulated in the same way that the, the whiskey industry is regulated. Um, and we have, we have known examples of, for example, a, a five-year-old rum, where we might expect if it was similar to a whiskey to have, for all of the liquids who have been in a cask for five years before it, it was reduced to, to a bottling strength um, and sold, in some cases, we've seen a blended rum where one part of the blend is five years old and the rest of it is, is much newer. In some cases, we've seen it's five years since, the, <clears throat> since the, the base sugar fermentation was conducted. And in some cases, it's five years since the sugar cane was harvested. So, so much, much less. But I don't, think I've really, I don't think I've really answered your question there in, in terms of what the difference is. The, the, the sort of rum that, that we're buying in are produced in a column still very similar to the one that we have, we have downstairs here. And that gives the, the spirit a particular, particular characteristics. Um, it's not, not a bad rum, it's, it's not a good rum, it just has, has different characteristics. Many of the sort of traditional distilleries in um, in the Caribbean will be running column stills, but they'll also be running, running pot stills where there's, there are no, no, for example, copper plates in the column, which is stripping out some of the flavor elements in the, in the base fermentation. So a lot more of the characteristics of the fermented sugar are coming through the still and in, into the finished rum. And because a pot still can only achieve a certain sort of alcoholic strength, in relation to, to, to the base liquid, what they'll tend to do is put it through the pot still a, a number of times. <clears throat> and, that, and that will, as I say, will preserve many of the flavor characteristics which are coming, are coming from the base, base fermentation. Now, you say from the equipment downstairs, just, just the way that we make, um, make some of our rums. Um, there's a couple that we make using, our, using the column setup that we have down there. There's others that we make where we take all of the copper plates out and we just do a straight lift um, from the liquid that we've got potentially through, through botanicals. But there are plenty of people that in the UK that are also using different production methods to make rum, some of them from their own sugar fermentations, blending it with, with aging it, mixing it with some of their own aged product, buying in aged product from elsewhere and blending it. And really, you know, the, um, it's it's a bit of a sort of sort of thousand thousand aisle dressing literally. Um, if if you're in the Caribbean, 
and you're buying rums that are produced in different places, everybody will be doing it in different ways. And you might find that they're, they're buying in spirits that have been produced in one distillery to blend with something that's been produced in their distillery to give, to give a, different, um, a different sort of taste and feel, feel to the spirit. Okay, I've got one more question, but I'd say it's for the end. So have you, have you got any more drinks to make? And, uh... well, yeah, I will do, I'll do one more gin and tonic. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna put the ice in last on this one. This is, this is the wild round gin and tonic. Again, nice and simple. Um, these, are, these are actually quite ripe blackberries. And again, I hope no one picks, up, picks me up for buying, um, buying fruit that's out of season. Um, the reason why, why we use something like a blackberry um, is because it's not too sweet. Um, and if you're mixing a dry gin with a red fruit, um, it's probably best to do it with a berry that isn't, isn't that sweet. Um, however, we would always be, always be in favor of using something perhaps which is a little bit more in season um, than the blackberry. Um, frozen blackberries equally are very good, especially if they're, own, they're your own frozen blackberries. Um, in this case, I'm gonna pour, pour a little bit of the spirit directly over the blackberries. Um, and what you might see there is some of the color coming out and we're gonna see how well this is gonna work. Um, I'm gonna pop a little bit of ice in. And that's, that hasn't worked too badly. Um, and a little bit of tonic water and hopefully Luke will be able to capture that. Um, so if you do fancy a gin, which is a little bit more fruity, but don't really feel like experimenting or buying a fruit gin where you're not sure whether the flavors are, are artificial or not, it's very simple um, to make some nicely colored, colored fruit gins or fruit gin drinks. Um, Without, without having to, to go into that sort of market. It's also a great, a great use for, for a, good, a good quality um, dry gin. The only, the only other drink I'm gonna make this evening, Gina, before we finish, if I can get a little bit more ice out of my ice box, is, is, our, is our take on the, um, on the dark and stormy. I'll just move some of these, uh, some of these out of the way. Luke's in for a good evening this evening. Right, so. Tip, tip the cameraman in, in drinks. Um, so in this case, uh, a bit of ice. Um, we're going to take a slice of lime. Now what I, I tend to like to do with this is just to, to squeeze the lime a little bit um, so we can, we can really get some, some, some of the flavor up. We go very simple. Um, in this case, uh, the Intrepid Ram rum. and top that up with a, a good quality ginger beer or, or ginger ale, um, according to taste. In the summer, this is, this is absolutely one of, one of my favorites. I quite happily drink that all night. Right, Luke's gonna, gonna pan, pan back a little bit. And then, Gina, have we got, have we got some more questions? Yeah, so the, the last question I had for you, which was for the end, um, and I will read this exactly as it's written, is, does Tony send gin deliveries out nationwide? And if so, is there any discount for old blues, question mark, smiley face, cheers? <laughs> um, I think we've actually got an offer on the website at the moment. So um, this is a cue for me to... Me to do what I want to, this is why I'm so bad at sales and marketing, because I, I can never even ask for sponsorship money when I was little. Um, if you go to uh, YorkshireDalesDistillery.com, um, we have a shop on there, um, affectionately known as The Bar, B -B -A, um, where you can order, and yes, we do ship um, nationwide, either with Royal Mail or UPS, um, depending on the size of the order. Um, at the moment, we don't actually have an old blues discount set up, but I will look into that. Anyone that comes to the distillery, comes to the distillery we, we, will, we will sort a discount out with. Um, but you can also order by phone. I, I would say at the moment, the office isn't going to be manned for another couple of weeks because of COVID. But regularly when the office is manned, um, you can telephone, you can place an order by phone, um, and you would certainly get a discount there. Uh, and I have to say, again, a little um, pop-up on my screen from Sarah says, 
Uh, you can get 17% off online. Use the code BUNNY17. So there we go, everyone. BUNNY17. Uh, to everyone. Um, I think, Gina, I said so we were going to do a prize draw this evening. What we'll do, if you can forward us the names afterwards, um, rather than trying to, trying to coordinate that now. Um, yeah. And then we'll do we'll do the prize draw and perhaps you, you can publish it so that we've got a bit of transparency. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I will do. Um, I've got the list of everyone who's attended tonight, and um, I, I'll go back to the lady who asked about the uh, the gin because she sent me a, a desperate message at about eight o'clock saying she had to leave and could I let her know? So um, we will do that. And there were some other questions as well. So what I'll probably do is if I'll, I'll pop every uh, question we've had tonight over to you, and if there's any you want to uh, to answer, we can put that all into an email and send it to the people that attended. Brilliant. Um, I think it probably just remains for me to say thank you very much to Luke, um, who has been, I think, great on the camera tonight, or obviously I can't see. Um, Jim, thank you very much for, for organising the whole, the whole series of, of talks, but obviously in particular the opportunity um, for, for us to talk tonight and to thank everybody that's, that's joined us online. It's, it's really good um, that you've been able to join us and actually have, have a tour. And, and I'm sorry, it wasn't a tasting at the distillery um, that, that you wouldn't have otherwise, we wouldn't have otherwise been able to give you. No, that's, that's great. And thank you so much for giving your, your time up on a, on a Wednesday night to drink copious amounts of gin with us. So that's great. Um, uh, as Tony says, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we have another talk next Friday. Um, details are on the website. And like I say, I will drop everyone uh, an email with follow up on the questions and the prize draw in uh, the next few days, probably after Easter. Have a lovely Easter, everyone. Chocolate and orange gin, get it online. Bunny 17, two things in one there. Uh, thanks, Tony.